Parshas Ki invariably is read in the weeks leading up to Rosh Hashanah. And so when we read this Parsha, we're supposed to find significance to helping us prepare for the high holidays. So many of the Hasidic masters take their cue from the Zohar and understand that even the very first mitzvah of when you go out to war against your enemies is talking about something much bigger than just in the ancient world when you'd go to conquer the, the nations that are indigenous to Eretz Yisrael and you see a beautiful woman and you want to marry her and she's not Jewish, this is the protocol that you must undergo in order to be able to be permitted to marry her. And there's a variety of commentary on this. Um, but that's essentially the section that we're just going to take a brief look at today. In order to see how this is applicable to our lives, um, there's a, a line from the Zohar that is worthwhile seeing. You know, the Torah tells us that the protocol is a man is going to a soldier after he goes out and he vanquishes the enemy on the battlefield, he is filled with such passion that is a result of aggression. And that's human nature. God created us with that nature. That after you've done something like really violent, you need to quench that, that aggressiveness. And there's almost like a sexual energy that, needs, that is pent up and needs to be released. And that's what's going to happen when you're on the battlefield. You're going to see a beautiful woman. You're going to want to marry her. And there's a protocol. So the Torah says, Bring her to your house. Have her shave her hair. And, um, you know, uh, uh, cut her nails so that she removes all of her external trappings. And she has to remove all of the attractive clothing that she's worn before. She's uh, going to have to mourn and cry over her family that she separated from for Yerach Yamim for a full month. And then, V'achar Kain, the Torah says, and if after all of that month of seeing her in her, you know, her less than glamorous uh, appearance, you know, you really want to still marry her, you're still enamored with her, so then, okay, then go ahead and she can be your wife. But if you don't want her after that time, don't mistreat her. She's a human being. She's created with God's image. Don't sell her into slavery. You brought her into your home. You cannot mistreat her after that point, And therefore, you have to send her away free. Okay, so comes along the Zohar, and it says... Take a look in source number two. This is from the Zohar Chadash, which is a post-Zoharic Zoharic text. She will cry for her father and mother for a full month. But notice the way the Torah writes a full month. Yerach Yamim, a month of days. So the Zohar says, Dahi Yarcha De Elul. This refers to the month of Elul. The month of Elul? What, what are you talking about? This refers to the month of Elul. Well, the Zohar, of course, is quite cryptic and mysterious, right? Let's see if we can understand what the Zohar is telling us. But, the Bey Salik Moshe, Litura, Nemibae Rachamin Kame Kudshabrihu, Elul was the month that Moshe went up to Mount Sinai to pray for mercy for the Jewish people. So that the Jews would be finally forgiven for the sin of the golden calf. So we know Moshe did a lot of crying during that month on Mount Sinai. He says that's the meaning of crying for her father and mother. Basically, there's a lot of crying. But the crying is over the degradation that not only the Jewish people experienced as a result of the golden calf, but the degradation of the Torah and the degradation of God himself because his chosen people fell from, from their grace, fell from their glory. And basically that's the theme of the Zohar. We're not going to go and read the rest of the passage because it gets even more esoteric after that. Now let's take a look 
and I apologize that it's in Rashi script, I couldn't find a text that was in regular block script, but it's from a sefer called Yakar Mipaz, and it's the Torah of Rav Yisrael Hopstein, also known as the Koshnitzer Magid. Who was the Koshnitzer Magid? He was from the third generation of Hasidim in the late uh, 18th century, uh, a student of the Magid of Mezerich, but basically taking the Torah of the Baal Shem Tov and the Torah of the Arizal based on the Zohar and using it to try to bring, bring people closer to God, to the Torah and to each other. So he has, I'm just, I just took a few uh, snips from a larger piece. And so the Kajnitzer Magid was best known for his sefer called Avodas Yisrael. Um, but there were additional sayings from the Kajnitzer Magid that his students collected in this sefer called Yakar Mipaz. And so that's what we're looking at today. The, the text reads as follows. Vera'isa bashivya eshes yifas toar. You will see among the captives a woman who is beautiful. Ki be'et chet o azai holech mimenu haneshama shihi chelek elokai, eloki, lemakom shenech tseva. Va'azai chote od yoter, im holech gam haruach, Let's explain what he just said. There are times in life when I can degrade myself, defile myself with bad behavior. And when that happens, I not only can sometimes estrange myself from others if I behave badly, but I can estrange myself from myself. What do I mean? I estrange myself from myself. I lose my neshama. My neshama is repulsed by my behavior. My neshama actually, a portion of my neshama leaves me and goes back and says, I don't want to stick around with this guy. He's, he's, a, he's a beast. I don't want to be around him. So the actual neshama of a person can actually feel very, very distant from a person. And part of what we have to try and do when we do tshuva is not only to return back to those with whom we feel estranged, but it's actually to return back to ourselves, not just to, and not just to Hashem, but return back to ourselves, to reclaim our lost soul. And he says it's much, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very low state that a person can get to because when your soul leaves you, all you have left is your animal spirit. So this passage at the beginning of Parshat's Kitetze that we're studying is referring to the Baal Tshuva, a person who wishes to return. But to return to himself, you come to the battleground after fighting with your, you know, this internal struggle about how do I want to really live my life? Do I really want to continue this way? And you decide no, and you, you, you struggle, you struggle, you struggle, and you decide I'm going to do tshuva. And all of a sudden, you see this beautiful vision of a beautiful woman, which is your own soul coming back, because it, it realizes, hey, this guy's redeemable. And so your neshama slowly starts to come back to you. And that's the beautiful woman that you see on the battlefield. Yeah? So, wrote Salomar im tasem mitzvah the Torah tfila as ta'ir benafshecha uvefanecha ha neshama kdosha shalcha meitach. And basically, what it means is, is that if you are committed to rehabilitating your behavior on the battleground of life, then you'll you'll catch a vision of that beautiful neshama that you lost. You'll be able to reclaim that spiritual greatness that was once you, that left you and you'll be able to see the beauty of it on the battlefield. Okay? Let's just let that sink in for one second. Now we're going to go a little bit further down in the text. Later on, he talks about the specific part of where it says she will cry for her father and mother for 30 days, for a month. So what does that mean? Your neshama is crying. Uvachtayat aviyah vetima yerach yamim. Amar ha'ari ha'kadosh, shezeu chodesh elu. Or, um, I think the word re, or maybe that's referring to harav yochai, I'm not sure. 
either it's the Ari or it's referring to the Zohar, but it's a reference to the month of Elul. Shetzarich livkot lifnei Hashem yitbarach ba'ad Knesset Yisrael ulehitcharet alavonotav. That this is the month when you sort of get a glimpse of your neshama that's coming back, and together with your neshama you have to cry for the Jewish people and for the mistakes that I have made and that we have made. That's the crying that takes place during the month of Elul. The Yesh Lomar Mikol Makom Nikra Rosh Chodesh Elul Yerach. And he says, and maybe that's the reason why when we look at the text, it doesn't say Chodesh Yamim, it says Yerach Yamim, which is a very unusual way to describe a month. Normally, how does the Torah describe a month? Chodesh Hazelachem, this month is for you. What does the word Yerach mean? Yareach is a moon, right? But Yareach doesn't just mean a moon, as you'll see in just a second. Mipnei Shehu Lashon Yareach Ben Yomo. Shahlevana Nikreit Bishalosh Lashanot. Yareach Sihara Ulevana. He says, when you think about it, the moon has three words that describe the moon two in Hebrew, one in Aramaic, but they're all used in, in the totality of Jewish literature. There are three words for a moon. One is Yareach, and one is Levana, and the third one is Sihara. Sahar. Sahar. Also the moon, right? Yeah. In mo- even in modern Hebrew, yes? Okay, so Sahar. I wonder if it's tied into Sahara. Cause that's no, Sahara is it. It's a... Uh... The desert. I know, I know, but Sahar, okay. With the Samach, yeah. So Sahar, Yareach, and Levana. They all describe, they're all words for the moon. But the word Yareach describes the new moon. It describes the moon when it's just a very, very small crescent at the first phase of the moon in the beginning of the month. Nik- Yareach nikra batechilat hachodesh shematchil lehitkadel ulahair. He says the word Yareach is used when the sun first appears in its first phase at the beginning of the month when it's just starting to illuminate. Ulevana beemsa chodesh. The word levana means it's white. That's the full moon in the middle of the month. The sihara besofo she'eno meira. Vehi kamo bevet hasoha. He says the reason why it's called Sahar or Sihara is because it's at towards the end of the month when it's waning and it's not able to illuminate as it once was and that's why it's related to imprisonment. It's because it's no, it's no longer in power. Okay? Uvechodesh Elul niftachin sha'arei tshuva. So in Elul the gates of repentance are opened. And so in Elul, a person has to start thinking to himself, I am a neophyte. I am a beginner. I'm just starting along this process of repentance. No matter how old I am, I could be a middle-aged man and I, or woman, and I still realize that I'm just beginning down this road. And that's why Elul is called Yareach or Yerach Yamim. This is the month where the moon is just starting or my light is just beginning to illuminate because, you know, it's a process that we start in Elul and that we try to bring to its climax on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And then the Torah says, if you've gone through that full month of crying, then you can finally be husband and wife with your beloved Eishe Sifas Torah, but with your loved, beloved Neshama. Rod Salomar, Sha'ata Tira Lihiyot Habal Shel HaNeshama. You can become reunited with your soul and sort of be in control, be the, be the husband of your Neshama. Okay, so that's what's being described over here. And then the Torah says, But v'haya im lo But if you discover that you don't really want her, yeah, you, you've consummated the relationship after a month of crying, but then all of a sudden you lose the magic. And you realize this is not the woman that you want to be your wife. Don't mistreat her. 
So the Torah says, "Vehayim lo chafatz the bahat Torah kedusha hibita at sof kol hadorot." The Torah is looking into the future, and it says, "She yishkama anashim shosim tshuva b'rosh hashanah v'yom hakipurim." And the Torah's insight is, is that there are lots of people who really, really have this passion during Elul. They cry and they're sincere. And then finally, they, at Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, they have this tremendous sense of closeness with God. And they come back to their neshama in its, in its totality and it's amazing and there's fireworks and there's music and everything is amazing. And then what happens after Yom Kippur? And then after Simchas Torah is over, after Yom Kippur is over, after Simchas Torah is over, ah, go back to my, my banal lifestyle. Kamosha Shamati Omrim, Yigmorna Ra Rishaim, Haim, Chaf Aleph Yom, Erosh Chodesh Elul, I'm sorry, Nun Aleph Yom, Erosh Chodesh Elul. Ad achar simchas Torah. So he says, there's a pasuk that says, Yigmor na ra rishayim. May there be, please, an end to the evil of the wicked. And the word na means 51, which is the number of days, starting with Rosh Chodesh Elul, until the end of simchas Torah, there are 51 days. That's the gematria of the word na. Matchil ra rishayim. That's when we start all over again to descend into the nonsense that we get involved with. Al-Kain, he's here at Torah. Umachor lo tim karena bakasef. Don't sell her away for money. You've just acquired this beautiful neshama. Don't discard her just because you feel you can get, you can sell, sell your soul. Rotz lomer, shalo tim kor ha-neshama od bechemdot v'tavot ra'ot milashon nechsof nechsaf v'tachat asher inita bimei elul lo tit amer ba od. Torah says, don't give her up. Don't throw her away. Don't discard her because of your petty desires and just lose your neshama all over again. So that's, that's the message, which is there's this yearning and pining and desire for a, a yerach yamim that we embark on on this month of Elul. And then finally, finally, after 30 days of Elul, we come to Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, these 10 amazing days where we feel, we're supposed to feel the sense of great closeness. We've reclaimed our soul. Ah, and then once Yom Kippur is over, v'hayayim lo chafat staba. Ah, you discover the magic is gone. I'm not scared anymore of red, divine retribution. I'm not inspired anymore. There's a kiddish club in somewhere in the, one of the back rooms. Someone made a joke. Someone disparaged the rabbi. Everything becomes a galechter. Everything becomes funny again. And the magic is lost. Ah. Go back to the doldrums, to the, to the trenches of life, and press repeat. And then we, that's how we never progress because at the end of Simchas Torah, that end of that 51-day cycle of growth and immersion and this, all of these efforts, ah, uh, tamerba, don't exchange it, don't throw it away. Why would you want to throw that away? Try and at least maintain it for as long as possible. And that's the message of the Eishet Tifat Torah, of this beautiful woman who's you're really your beautiful neshama, you know, you've worked so hard. Keep it, keep it, keep that neshama with you as long as you can. Yes. So um, I understand the metaphor, but um, these Jewish men, they're taking non-Jewish women to be their wives, and it, that's permissible here? So Rashi tells us, it's a great question, Rashi tells us, lo dibra Torah ele keneged yetzer hara. That's why I prefaced what I was saying is, is that sometimes there is this, such a bloodlust after this extreme aggressiveness that God recognizes that sometimes there's this uncontrollable hunger that exists within, within a, 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 a male soldier that can only be extinguished with, uh, 
with this kind of behavior. Uh, and God says, listen, I know that's your nature, so let me create an outlet for you to be able to channel your desires into a, in, in a permissible way. So God says, go through this protocol. And if you follow the protocol, you'll know, you'll at least have this uh, sort of peace of mind and the, the, um, the reassurance that you'll be able to be with this woman in the way that you want to be. I'm giving you permission, but do it in this way. And hopefully through this process, where she uh, de-accessorizes, um, or however else you want to describe it, you'll come down a little bit. So the, the woman, let's say he wants to keep her after this process. Yes. Is she convert or? The, well, that's a, that's a good question. The assumption, is, the assumption is, is that she's going to be part of the Jewish community now. Okay. And the Torah says, yes, there's a way to do that. Now, whether the Torah requires a formal conversion process in the way that we do it today is unclear from the text. It's discussed in the Gemara. But it seems that this is one of the few situations where the Torah allows for a conversion for the sake of marriage. Even if she's not going to fully commit herself to a life of mitzvot, we allow for such a conversion in this unique circumstance. Okay? Have a great day, everybody.